Good morning to all our audience today. On behalf of the US Soybean Export Counter, we want to welcome you to the first session of the Industry Producers Association Conference today on the topic of uh, strengthening producer associations. My name is Belinda Pignotic. I'm a US SEC uh, representative for a number of regions since uh, 1996, and, and it's an honor to uh, do the transmission today. This three day activity that we have it has the purpose of uh, working together with producer associations within the uh, animal feed uh, production chain to analyze um, possible opportunities and threats in this area. We have a great international audience today and we're going to take advantage of every minute of this um, event so that our speakers can share their um, knowledge and experience. So we would like to start this um, event eventually. And to start the agenda, we're going to uh, give the floor to Carlos Salidas, our America's Regional Director. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Carlos Salidas uh, history. He's the uh, main re responsible uh, for implementing sales strategy for USEC in the region. He was uh, previously a senior director for US Soybean Meal in our headquarters in San Luis. And he also worked uh, before this, he worked in Bungie in the US where he was responsible for aligning global strategy within uh, North America, previously Bunky, and also the um, markets of Brazil and Singapore. And prior to this, he was with ADM and Continental Grades. Carlos, welcome. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Belinda. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, so good morning to all and welcome to the first day of our um, conf um, associations conference. It's a pleasure to be here with uh, and uh, on this hour, hour and a half, we will uh, hear from world uh, class sp speakers. We are uh, grateful for the presence of Oliver Yarbrough and Zach West Weston. In a few minutes, Belinda will give you more details about our presenters. We also want to uh, welcome Jose Daniel Rodriguez, the executive director of AMEPA, who will be moder moderating the Q&A session finally. We end it, we'll end this uh, program with Dr. Maria Mayorga, who will share some outlook on the um, animal protein ratio. So I want to take uh, advantage of this time to share some words on uh, USEC. Uh, they gave me too much time. I won't take so much time. The US Soybean Export Council, known as USEC, or uh, is a dynamic association of soy producers uh, companies, uh, transformation companies of agricultural products and commodities transportation companies, uh, sellers, partner agricultural companies and related organizations that collaborate to increase preference for soy in the United States around the world. It's a not-for-profit organization and has over 100 members and it is acknowledged as a agricultural cooperator in the uh, United States, similar to other organizations that you have relationships with, uh, such as uh, U.S. Grades Council, U.S. Wheat Associates, etc. USAC works together with the United Soybean Board, the USB. The American Soybean Association, known as the ASA. And the Foreign Agricultural Service, the FAS. Uh, of the United States Department of Agriculture, and also with qualified state soybean boards, or QSSBS, and its own membership to develop programs that will promote and represent the U.S. soy industry around the world. In general, it promotes the use of soy, U.S., um, on uh, balanced feed for animals, in agriculture for human consumption, and it communicates the benefits of the use of soy through education, training, and uh, engaging uh, sector leaders uh, with a solid menu of programs and projects around the world. Our customers trust our um, high quality team to provide uh, commercial and technical services uh, to solve market access challenges and develop long lasting relationships. 
so USEC was uh, founded in uh, uh, Oct October 2005, based on almost 100 years of uh, work done by U.S. soy um, soy producers, and it was created to form an independent organization of international marketing. It is funded by the Chekhov program of soy agri uh, soy farmers. Um, the USDA and contributions from North American industry work in 80 plus countries with employees and consultants in every region. We're known as part of the US soy family. The US soy family includes uh, three fundamental arms. One is USB, the United Soybean Board, which uh, focuses on research and outreach. And it's um, it aims to increase profitability of farmers, invest in research development and promotion of U.S. soy, and it uh, heads up communication of farmer initiatives. And it is only funded by uh, checkoff from U.S. producers. The other one is the ASA, which has uh, representation and lobbying uh, capacities um, with uh, the legislative branch and uh, government of offices of the United States um, and on internal policies. It is funded by individual memberships for producers and it works hand in hand with the USB and USSEC. And USSEC in itself uh, focuses on marketing and market development. We want to build the reputation and preference for US soy around the world. And it seeks out new markets and expands existing ones funded by the Chekhov and the USDA. Our mission is to uh, maximize U.S. soy use around the world, uh, satisfying the needs of uh, st stakeholders and clients around the world, and creating that efficiency. We focus on supporting knowledge, education, preference, and obviously results. Uh, U.S. Office for the Americas. Uh, is headquartered in Guadalajara, in the state of Jalisco in Mexico. Um, and from there, we coordinate different projects to implement different activities to uh, attend different countries, which mainly include Mexico and Central America. We have Guatemala, Costa Rica, Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, and Panama. In South America, we have Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Venezuela, and also Chile, and obviously the Caribbean with Dominican Republic and Jamaica. In general, the main function is to represent U.S. SAIC uh, before different sectors that can be known as stakeholders. And this includes companies and their associations, uh, trade sector groups, including uh, soybean uh, processors that represent a very important supply of oil and soybean in our markets, uh, manufacturers of balanced feed for different species, whether they're commercial or integrators, um, animal uh, protein producers, including uh, poultry, aquaculture, um, pork, and other species involved in food, the food processing chain. It stays a continuous communication to seek to uh, understand the needs of importers and users of soybean products and support them with their development and growth. Through different activities, it communicates on the different uses and advantages of U.S. soy um, in generic and specific forms. Uh, depending on the different sectors and the types of business we mentioned before. In particular, we uh, perform technical assistance and commercial assistance activities that include an ample range of topics, and these are covered in different depths depending on the objectives and the target audience. We also touch on different areas of the purchasing process, uh, raw materials handling and processing, so that we can provide the market with quality pro products. We give a lot of importance to time leaders and quality. We seek to support uh, company efficacy, efficiency, and competitiveness. We work with a holistic vision to identify opportunities, design and implement activities that help with this. And it's very important that the companies that are our stakeholders understand and have the resources, have, have elements of a differentiation from other sources of soy, and that they can understand and take advantage of the value of U.S. soy. We want to contribute to a proper distinction between price and value. We also um, follow up market access situations, uh, administrative, and we report and evaluate our programs 
at activities. We believe it's reasonable to state that most of you have participated in USEC activities, either general or specific, in topics and audiences, and uh, several different conferences, seminars, and courses. We have also um, made individual technical visits to your plants and installations. Um, topics have included uh, raw materials purchasing, risk management, international contracts, um, grain and meal management and storage, formulation and nutrition for different spe species, uh, manufacturing of balanced feed, including uh, technical aspects on equipment and processing and good manufacturing practices, production, etc. What do we, what is our outlook for the next year? We would like to continue working closely with all of you and with your uh, members, um, making you participants in our programs and participating in your programs. We, um, it is very important for us that we go in depth into differentiating U.S. soy, its characteristics and nutritional values. We've been working on evaluating raw materials, uh, contributing elements and scientific foundations for a more informed decision-making process that will allow moving from uh, buying protein points to recognizing the nutritional value of U.S. soy. We know that these aren't simple changes that uh, include different areas of companies, their leadership, their um, acquisition, nutrition, and formulation functions, who must all work together. Regarding sustainability, we have uh, provided information on our sustainable soy assurance protocol, the certifications, and the seal that are available for uh, USEC customers. Uh, 10 years ago, this topic was just seen as a trend. It was seen as something important, but it is a fact that sustainability is here to stay. However, we feel that the industries that become more and more involved, associations play a very, very important role in guiding sectors. Some companies have uh, owned the message and adopted sustainable practices. As USEC, we will continue collaborating, reaffirming the message of US soy sustainability together with conferences and a specific program on sustainable processes at uh, balanced feed plants on a regional level. At times like now, the uh, price of uh, grains and oleaginous products um, has greater importance. After the last quarter of 2020, commodities have gone up in general, and corn and soy have been no exception. They play a critical role in the formulation and results of companies. This was complicated by factors like the exchange rate, uh, the behavior of foundations and transportation costs, uh, together with um, the behavior of, company, of countries' economies that had an impact on commercial flows, impacted mobility, available uh, revenue for each company, and this required altering projections and working capital flows. Let's remember what uh, Warren Buffett said, price is what you pay, value is what you receive. I reiterate an invitation to evaluate um, raw materials and formulation and their impact on animal development, which is very important regarding the price situation we have right. And we will continue with programs and technical conferences that will allow you to take advantage of the information of data management, allow you to take advantage of the available information. We have made a lot of progress in technology in data flows, in scientific research on the use and yields of inputs. Uh, companies need to learn more, take advantage of available, research, of available resources, increase their knowledge, and adopt this to improve their efficiency and competitiveness. We are here to help you. USEC has been present and will continue helping the industry. We hope to continue with an open communication within the associations between organizations and the sector itself and continue with conversation with other stakeholders. Today, we need to maintain a, an ample uh, perspective of the uh, supply chain. It is clear our involvement with the US soy producer sector, our interests are uh, common. Uh, we have a lot of experiences, but we still have a lot of potential that we can capitalize on. So Belinda, I give the floor back to you. Thank you very much, Carlos. We're going to continue with our agenda for today, and we're going to introduce our first speaker, Mr. Oliver Yarbrough. But before, I would like 
telling him about his history, I would like to remind you that you have the uh, Q&A tab uh, that you can access uh, beside the chat or in the app. Uh, don't forget to ask your questions because it's important to have your feedback. Mr. Oliver Yarbro is a prof certified professional in project management, has a master's from the Allen Graduate School of Business. He's an author, speaker, trainer, an expert leader in project management, expert in PMP management, and um, he combines practical experience from the real world with the foundations of uh, project management. Oliver offers new perspectives and encourages his audience to act in a captivating, entertaining, and realistic um, manner. So let's listen to Oliver and see what he has to tell us. Oliver, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. Very glad to be here today to talk about a topic that's uh, very familiar to a lot of us in some ways because we all deal with, with change. But I want to talk about how we can deal with change uh, in regards to corporate strategy. So here's our agenda. We will define what change management is because it's kind of hard to uh, do it if you don't really know what you're talking about. And then we'll discuss the different types of changes we will then go into managing uh, changes in your corporate strategy. And then we'll talk about some final questions. I'd like to start this with a quote. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of this author, John Gartner, but he said, most ailing organizations have developed a functional blindness to their own defects. They are not suffering because they cannot resolve their problems, but because they cannot see their problems. And when, when we think about this, a lot of the times we, we get comfortable in where we're at and we see the future being a lot like the past was. But when we're in an environment such as the one we're in right now, we can't go along with that same mindset because what worked yesterday may not work tomorrow or it may not work as well as it did. So we have to now identify areas that, that we can improve both internally and in some cases externally to move our uh, associations forward. Okay, defining change management. So what is change management? It's a process that we take to ensure that changes are implemented successfully within our organizations. Uh, in order to do that, we first need to identify where changes are coming from so that we can, we, we can then identify which aspects we want to improve upon. So change can come from a number of areas. Some, some of the ones I've identified and I want to focus you on are the changes happening globally, okay? And then technological innovation. So maybe we are familiar with some of the global changes, but what about the changes in technology? doing things better, doing things more efficiently. And then as well as we all know too well, crises. Um, a crisis can take us from one state to, to another state very quickly. For example, look at the world where we're living in now where a lot of things are being done remotely. Um, now we've been working remotely for a while, but who could have imagined a year and a half ago that we would be doing most of our work this way instead of just some of it? That's just one example of many. Um, also, we have to look at the forces that are uh, helping us to move forward uh, both internally and externally. Okay, in general, there's multiple ways to approach this, but there are generally three different phases to any change. Okay, you have a preparation phase uh, where you figure out you know, where you are now and what you're going to actually do in order to get to your endpoint. And then you have some phase where you actually implement or execute what you plan for in the beginning. And then at some point, you, you will have to review what you did to make sure that you implement it 
what you said you were going to implement in the beginning. Uh, some, and so feeding on this point, some of the areas that uh, change can improve include things such as culture, operations, technology, and processes. Let me talk real briefly about these, okay? So culture. When we talk about culture, we're ultimately talking about people, okay? And if we're talking about people, we're also talking about a mindset. So there's many different, there's many different or de definitions for um, culture. But what I want to drive the point here is that culture at the end of the day involves a mindset. So if we're going to change our associations, we first need to you know, adapt our culture. And adapting a culture means to get people in the right mindset. So what do I mean by mindset? I mean, thinking holistically, uh, seeing a big picture view of where we want to take our associations. And we do that by first asking why. This is how you start to begin to, to get everyone on the same page is you focus everyone around a common why. For example, why do we want to implement this change? Um, you know, wh why is it necessary? What's the value of it ultimately to ourselves, to, to our other stakeholders, including customers, um, in including um, anybody who might be impacted by this change? And once we've identified that, now we, now we can ultimately get everyone on the same page and behind one uh, single goal. And that can motivate us because there will be ups and downs. Um, when I refer to operations, I'm referring to the things you do in order to ultimately deliver value to your uh, customers. So this typically involves you creating whatever it is you create or you helping your customers get what, whatever it is you're ultimately offering them. If you can improve that, that can have a, a very big um, uh, change impact on the way you do things. Then as well, technology. Technology can take us from point A to, to point B faster. Think of it as the difference between walking from point A to, to point B or, or taking a car. Yes, you can get from point A to point B by walking, but in a lot of cases, especially if there's greater distance, uh, taking a car can make a lot more sense. And that's the same uh, mindset I want you to think about when we talk about technology, because technology is always changing and improving. And if we stay on top of the latest and greatest, that can help us uh, stay on top of things and also remain competitive uh, in, in the force of a lot of other changes. And then processes. Processes are ultimately step-by-step -step directions you take in order to accomplish your goals. So typically, if you've been in business or you've been around a while, you have certain processes in place for doing certain things. And if we do them for so long, we at times take that for granted in, in that, oh, it's always worked like, like we've always done these processes in this order. Well, there comes a time where you may need to revisit those processes to see if they're still efficient and if they're still best, if they are still the best practices for doing it that way. One, one of the key areas I've seen, and this is applicable to any industry, and you've probably heard of this term agile. Well, being agile and being flexible. So another way of saying agile is being flexible. Uh, that's something that you may not have built into your processes. So look for ways that you can now take, take your processes and make them more agile or be, be more flexible in, in the face of changes or things that you may not have been able to anticipate. Okay, so let's go into talking about the types of changes, okay? There are two major types of changes. The first are adaptive changes. Um, adaptive changes are done incrementally, meaning they're, they're not all done at once. You typically you know, uh, implement something, step back and see if it worked, and then, and then you go and implement the next aspect of it. Step back and see, and, and see if it works, and then you Im implement the next one. And by doing this, it's sort of like you were implementing change gradually instead of doing it all in one fell swoop. 
this is important because a lot of the, a lot of the times when we try to make too big of a change too quickly, we can disrupt our uh, associations in, in a way that is counterproductive. And that's what we don't want to do. So just be cognizant of the fact that you can and should probably in most cases, look at making whatever change it is you want to make, make it incrementally, okay? The other type of change I want to talk about here is transformational change. Transformational change are big changes. These take a lot of time and a lot of resources to implement. Um, and they're typically done for things of a larger nature. There, there is a time and a place for, uh, for implementing transformational changes. Um, you know, sometimes, for example, you are faced with such a risk or something that has to be addressed right now you can't wait to do it incrementally. For example, when we all had to start working remotely in March of last year, I mean, there was no time to incrementally do things and let's so, sort of figure it out over the next three or four months. We had to come up with plans within days, definitely with, within weeks. That in some cases, especially if you have a large uh, association, that could be uh, very disruptive, but necessary. All right, so adaptive versus transformational changes. Most changes will happen in between adaptive and transformational changes. Um, this means that the change management process must be adapted for your specific situations. Uh, there is no one size fits all. There is no one brush of which you can paint across every single uh, uh, occurrence you might have. So you have to use some of your um, mindset and some of your thinking and just common sense and working through certain issues in order to come up with an outcome that works for you and your association. Okay, so now we wanna talk about how can we manage changes in our corporate strategy? There are many different approaches for which you could take. I thought back and I thought back through my experiences and you know, you know, I'll share one if, if, if it makes sense. But the main point is I wanted to offer you something simple, something that would not take you a long time studying and having to take, take a class on. And I thought back to how we manage quality. And I bring this up because Quality is something that affects every industry, okay? So the quality of your processes, the, the quality of your products and services. But I bring this up because this PDCA cycle, it stands for Plan, Do, Check, Act. This cycle is something that, that's used quite extensively in the quality management arena. And if it can be used in quality to ensure we produce a quality product or outcome, it can certainly be used if we're trying to implement changes in our strategy, okay? So let me just walk through real briefly and give you some sense of what this is and how you may be able to use it. So this, uh, this is basically uh, the process of which you would take here is to ask yourself, why is this change needed? Uh, if, if it's not a needed change, then it's sort of dead on arrival in that you're wasting time you have to have an underlying need, a burning desire to implement this change. Once you've identified what that why is, then you need to identify potential roadblocks. What could potentially stop us from successfully implementing this if we choose to? And then, you know, how can we remove those roadblocks in advance and so we don't get bogged down or get stopped halfway through our implementation process? With that in mind, let's walk through the four stages of the plan, do, uh, check, act cycle. So the first one here is we want to plan. Um, this means we identify the gaps between where we are today and where we want to be in the future. We will also determine risks and we will communicate with our stakeholders um, early and continuously throughout the entire cycle. This is very important because a lot of the times we, we will start off and paint a big picture and a big vision of where we want to be. And then as we go through the process of making that change, we forget to keep in touch and keep our stakeholders updated. 
And so they end up losing focus or losing interest. And then that causes a whole lot of other issues. Next, number two, do. So doing, as you might suspect, is executing, it's implementing. So this is where we implement the changes that we talked about in planning. And then we document the results as we go. This way, when we move into the checked, the check uh, aspect of the cycle, we have something to actually measure performance against plan. It's kind of hard to measure how we did if we haven't tracked what we said we were going to do and what we actually did. So that's what checking is. It's, it's measuring the difference between what we planned and what we actually did. And then the fourth aspect of this is the act. Uh, acting here is documenting the change process and identifying lessons learned. Why is this important? This is important because as we do future change initiatives, we don't want to keep recreating the wheel. Also, we'll, we will find over time that even though we, we may be making changes that are different in some aspects, the process of making a change tends to have a common theme. Uh, this mindset needs to be embedded in all of our teams, all of our associations, and so that going forward, this becomes almost second nature. It's something that people can own on their own without having to go and seek outside guidance every single time. So let me give you a br brief example here of uh, how I used it. I personally uh, implemented uh, what's, what's called a bounce scorecard um, early on in my career for an organization in Canada. Um, now a balanced scorecard, to make a long story short here, it balances the financial and non-financial measurements in an organization so that they can move forward and keep and keep track of how they are improving. So in doing that, you know, I had to get a lot of buy-in from a number of different uh, stakeholders in that the group. And that required basically showing them what's in it for them. So yes, we, yes, we had a big vision for the entire uh, group, but how did each one of them benefit in their individual teams and groups? That was key to getting buy-in from not just the executive team, but the people who worked underneath them. Um, and that's just one, one example, and I can answer more questions about that, but that's just one example of being able to get buy-in in, 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 in order to implement and move forward with changes. All right, and wrapping up here, you know, I will talk about some, some, some final questions here of which you may have, but I wanna leave you with some questions that you can ask in your association with your leadership or if you are a leader to ask of your teams and your team leaders, you know, for example, what changes are necessary? Yes, yes, I know we're doing good. Yes, I know we've been around a long time, but what can we ultimately improve upon? How can we get better? How can we stay agile? Then, you know, why are these changes important? Uh, how will I gain stakeholder buy-in? So it doesn't matter if I am trying to get buy-in from the leadership team, or if I am a leader trying to ultimately get buy-in from my team, you know, I need to ask myself, you know, how can I gain their buy-in? Then what will be the plan of action? Okay, we, we know that these, these changes are necessary. How can we now implement them? And then, you know, I, uh, once we have that plan and then it's going about how will we execute on that plan, when will the outcome be assessed? And so how often will we assess how we're doing? And then what adjustments need to be made in order to, to, to be able to move forward and accomplish the things which we need to accomplish? So I hope you uh, find value in these questions and I hope you're able to implement them in your association. With that being said, feel free to engage me. Here's my contact information. And at this point, I don't know if there's any Q&A, but I'm definitely open to it. Well, thank you, Oliver, for your presentation. Uh, we'll be having the Q&A session at the end of the second presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.
And so now moving on with the agenda. We now need to listen from Zach Weston. He comes from Good Food Institute and he is a supply chain manager in food services. Zach works in Good Food Institute FI. It's an international organization, nonprofit, based on the creation of a healthy food system, sustainable and resistant through innovation of protein, uh, proteins derived from fermentations and based on plants. He works with the main service operators of food, food manufacturers and supply chain companies of alternative proteins in order to help to improve the quantity and quality of meat, eggs from vegetal origin and also comply with the need of the growing demand of those alternative protein products. So let's now give the floor to Zach and share with us his message. Zach, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I appreciate that introduction and hello everyone. I'm excited to talk uh, about the uh, alternative protein industry, uh, particularly plant-based uh, meat, egg and dairy products. Uh, talk a little bit about how they're made and some of the opportunities we see for soy as an ingredient, uh, and then predictions for the future of this category uh, over the next few minutes here. Uh, first, uh, the Good Food Institute, uh, where I'm from, is a nonprofit uh, international think tank that's focused on promoting uh, alternative proteins, as we call them, uh, plant-based uh, meat, egg, and dairy products uh, across a wide variety of regions and to a wide variety of audiences. Uh, we work in the science and technology space to provide research grants uh, to researchers who are advancing the technologies of alternative proteins. Uh, I'm part of our corporate engagement team that works with everyone in the value chain from investors and distributors and manufacturers all the way through to retailers and restaurant chains uh, to help them promote and understand alternative proteins. And finally, we work in the policy realm to advocate for uh, level regulatory playing fields for alternative proteins, as well as to encourage global governments to invest in research in this uh, space. Uh, we have approximately 100 team members in six different regions globally, and I personally am part of the US-based team at the Good Food Institute. Uh, so first, an introduction to what we mean by alternative proteins. You're probably familiar with uh, at least a few of these technologies. The first uh, technology category we focus on is plant-based. So using plant proteins such as soy as the base for creating meat, egg, or dairy products. Uh, fermentation is a, another technology using things like mushrooms or al algae to produce protein. Uh, and finally, uh, another technology we focus on is uh, cultivated meat or cell culture technology. Uh, using uh, uh, tissue engineering technology to create meat directly from animals with no uh, slaughter required. Um, I'll be focusing most of this presentation on plant-based as it's the most commercially developed of these categories and likely the, um, the category that'll be most familiar to um, most of your consumers and, and partners. So plant-based meat is produced and egg and dairy products is produced by taking um, plant proteins along with fat, vitamins, minerals, and water and combining those into end product formulations that replicate a lot of the uh, experience of eating conventional uh, animal protein. The reason why this category is growing uh, fairly quickly and seems to have a lot more potential than it did over the past few decades is that uh, the consumer market for these products has really shifted uh, from being primarily uh, vegan or vegetarian consumers who give up uh, animal proteins entirely to being much more targeted at and embraced by omnivore consumers, uh, flexitarians, mainstream consumers who are trying to uh, increase their plant protein consumption and decrease their animal protein consumption. And that's, uh, uh, at least for most regions of the world, uh, obviously a much, much larger market, uh, potential addressable market for these products. Uh, we've seen this borne out in the research that we've done or research we've aggregated from other sources showing that the vast majority of consumers who are purchasing plant-based meat are also purchasing animal-based meat. So this is a, a dietary trend that's being driven by people who are having uh, maybe a, a pl plant-based burger one night and then a regular animal-based chicken uh, product the next night. Um, it's not being driven by people who are exclusively obtaining their protein from plant sources. Um, 
there's a, just a, a lot of different uh, statistics I could share. This is a look at the US market and the growth we've seen in, in plant-based meat specifically over the past couple of years, growing 45% to $1.4 billion category in 2020 uh, for uh, US retail sales. And this is something we're seeing across a variety of geographies. Um, this is from a study in Europe looking at, uh, I believe 11 different markets uh, and uh, showing that the sector grew by about 28% in the last period, including all forms of uh, plant-based meat, egg and dairy products. Um, and there is a, a really, a, it seems like a global interest in this category uh, that when we look across a variety of geographies, uh, consumers say that they would be interested in eating a plant-based meat substitute in a variety of countries. Um, so certainly not everyone, and there's no expectation that this is going to, um, you know, replace animal-based meat in uh, very many places, but it's something that has a significant potential uh, offering and uh, initial early adopter audience in a wide variety of regions. Oops, pardon me. Uh, the two things, though, that stand out as the most challenging um, areas with the need for increased uh, innovation and R&D uh, uh, focus and scaling investment are improving the taste and lowering the price of these products. They often are entering the market at a premium price point, and the sensory attributes of these products are uh, good in a lot of cases, but not great, and often are uh, not very competitive with a lot of existing uh, traditional animal protein products. Um, so there's still an awful lot of work to be done uh, and investments to be made in order to close that gap from a competitiveness standpoint. Um, the landscape of players in this space includes a lot of startups who've grown and scaled quite significantly in a wide variety of regions, but it's also increasingly including a lot of traditional animal protein providers, including some of the largest um, animal-based meat companies in the world. Uh, at this point, I believe about six of the um, top seven uh, US-based animal meat companies have either invested in or launched uh, product lines in uh, the plant-based protein category. And we're seeing a lot of that similar activity globally. And so this is something that uh, seems to be at least driven uh, both by uh, challenger brands as well as by established uh, protein brands who are already in the category and very well known to consumers. One of the uh, things that uh, signals a lot of uh, innovation ahead, and I think bodes very well for the future of this category, is the uh, increase in growth in investments. This is looking at total investments across the three technology areas we focus on uh, for meat, egg, and dairy alternatives over the past few years. And as you can see, 2020 was a, a record-breaking year, uh, resulting in about three, a little over three billion uh, U.S. dollars in invested capital in these different technologies. Um, this uh, investment has prompted a large wave of startups entering the space who are taking on a variety of product categories, consumer brands, uh, approaches to the supply chain, uh, B2B ingredient offerings, equipment offerings, etc. cetera. Um, and it's a very promising future. Uh, we have a lot of innovators working on this space and a lot of exciting things, I think, to come uh, in the category. So that brief introduction uh, to contextualize some of the growth and uh, some of the reasons why consumers seem to be interested in, in these products, uh, I'd like to turn to how they are made and some of the opportunities um, that I can highlight for uh, soy as a potential ingredient uh, or as an existing ingredient. Uh, fundamentally, what is needs to happen in the production of plant-based meat is uh, uh, getting plant-based proteins uh, to act like animal proteins at a sort of structural level. So instead of being more globular and used for storage, finding ways to make those proteins unfold and align themselves in, in fiber structures that replicate the experience of eating meat. Um, this is something that uh, is a relatively newer approach or newer discipline. And so there's still an enormous number of um, technological needs at really every step of the value chain where we need to optimize uh, the inputs, the raw ingredients, the uh, and materials that are used, uh, you know, maybe improving the soy content or the protein content of soy, maybe finding ways to make it easier to um, get the functionality and texture and structure that we're looking for in these products, uh, finding ways to process it, again, in ways that create a, a meat-like structure and texture, uh, and then formulating it correctly with fats and vitamins and uh, other um, additives to produce a, a really good end product formulation. Um, on the protein extraction side, a lot of the, the technology that 
is used to produce plant-based meat is done via extrusion. So finding ways to uh, improve the um, quality and ease of using soy in an extrusion environment, whether that's low moisture uh, or in particular high moisture extrusion is of immense interest to buyers in this uh, industry uh, and finding ways to uh, ensure that the texture structure uh, can be obtained while also um, reducing anti-nutrients and finding ways to improve the uh, digestibility and uh, bioavailability of protein and other nutrients is of a lot of interest to uh, plant-based meat manufacturers as they're looking for ingredients uh, to purchase. Uh, there are a variety of technologies that are currently being used at the end product level to uh, take uh, plant protein ingredients like uh, flowers, isolates, and concentrates and uh, make those into uh, plant-based meat products. Uh, the existing ones that are used the most are just traditional mixing, molding, and forming, as well as low moisture extrusion uh, and high moisture extrusion, particularly twin screw extrusion, is um, surging currently as one of the fastest growing methods for producing plant-based meat at high volumes at scale. Uh, there are certainly other uh, innovations on the horizon that could provide other ways of texturing and structuring plant-based meats, but extrusion remains the highest throughput uh, and most effective way to create uh, the more complex uh, fiber structure of many different uh, meat cuts. Uh, as a technology, um, high moisture extrusion uh, is uh, definitely um, something that only a few people understand. It's a relatively specialized uh, skill and discipline as compared to things like low moisture extrusion. Uh, and it's often highly variable. There are a number of different production parameters uh, such that it's difficult to uh, often predict. Uh, what you're going to get uh, when you're changing things. And as a consequence, uh, it's something that uh, a lot of, uh, we, we like to see a lot of innovation in to try to train more people in how to do it effectively. Uh, but there's a, a, a very large reliance or um, need for uh, ingredients that are predictable, that are homogenous, where there's a, a very easy to understand uh, use for it, that you don't have to, to make a lot of changes to your process as you get ingredient variability. And so soy is a, a really good candidate for that reason is prominently featured in a lot of existing plant-based meat products. Uh, the other technology that's used pretty frequently in this space is low moisture extrusion, which is used to produce things like textured vegetable protein from soy or textured other forms of uh, uh, plant protein such as textured pea protein. Um, very familiar technology that's been used for meat extension I've uh, been used to produce uh, meat alternative products for uh, decades um, and certainly some opportunity here to optimize this technology for the plant-based meat uh, end application, uh, but generally um, has a, a different textural uh, feel, uh, typically more useful for creating ground or minced products, uh, more restructured products that are further processed, uh, as opposed to whole muscle cuts of, uh, of meat, whereas high moisture extrusions a little bit more effective at creating more of a, a feeling of whole muscle cuts, more striated um, muscle tissue type fibers. Um, uh, these are just uh, this in the next slide are excerpts from our um, plant protein primer, which I would encourage you all to read if you're interested in further information about the competitive landscape for ingredients in uh, the plant-based meat, egg and dairy uh, category. Uh, just looking at some of the other additives and ingredients that are mixed together to create these products and some of the areas for opportunity for improvement based on the current challenges that the industry is facing. Um, I won't go into plant-based eggs at all since it's still a relatively small category, but uh, plant-based milk is another uh, growth category. Uh, plant-based milk obviously is uh, things like almond milk or soy milk or uh, oat milk have been uh, growing uh, quite a bit over the past few decades in popularity in, in various markets uh, and also still represent a, we think a market growth opportunity um, in that there's uh, certain cultures where um, there are natural advantages for plant-based milks, um, but it still suffers like plant-based meat from uh, uh, lack of uh, sensory attributes being what they need to be. There's still a lot of improvement that can be had here um, and a need for um, improved ingredients to hit the sensory goals and um, price point goals of the uh, uh, of consumers. One of the uh, nice things about plant-based meat production is that while there are some key differences, of course, with animal protein production, um, the further into the process you get, the closer you get to the packaged final product, the more similarity it bears to the um, traditional animal protein uh, uh, process and the more uh, easy it is to um, 
you utilize or repurpose equipment uh, and processors and uh, uh, expertise that's already been established in the animal protein business. Uh, so there are opportunities, of course, to improve the raw materials that we're using, uh, to uh, find better ways to process them into intermediary ingredients like isolates and concentrates and defatted flours. Um, and there's certainly a need for production method innovation. Uh, but once it comes out of the extruder and once it's uh, processed from there, it resembles a meat product and many of the existing processes and equipment uh, and systems can be used to um, package it, distribute it, and so on. Uh, because soy is uh, relatively inexpensive and widely available and very, very well understood, um, soy tends to be the dominant source of protein for most of the top selling plant-based meat companies that we track uh, globally. This is looking at the US, but the numbers are very similar globally. Um, and so we expect that that's going to continue. Um, soy and uh, wheat often, uh, either wheat in the breading or wheat as just a source of protein uh, is the featured um, uh, blend uh, or standalone protein in quite a few of the top uh, selling highest velocity plant-based meat products. Uh, so it currently exists as the market leader in this category. There are some uh, uh, plant proteins such as pea that have been growing rapidly, uh, but still represent a much smaller share of the market. And uh, even if they do grow, the overall market itself is growing fast enough that there is still an increasing demand for soy protein for these products, um, even if it isn't growing as fast as some of the other plant proteins within this, this small category. Um, one of the reasons why we're ultimately long-term bullish on soy uh, is that a consistent majority of consumers still, uh, of course, view soy as healthy. Um, and so we're very interested as a, um, a plant-based meat industry and plant-based egg and dairy industry uh, and seeing that continue and to continue to message the positive benefits of soy uh, as, a, as a protein and as an ingredient uh, in uh, food products. Uh, this is another summary slide looking at the advantages and disadvantages, uh, the competitive landscape for different ingredients as they are considered for use in plant-based uh, meat products specifically. I won't go into detail here for the sake of time, but I'm more than happy to share this uh, summary, uh, the, the, the full deck or full presentation that this is taken from uh, in case it would be helpful uh, to think about um, uh, and use for your own planning. I'm more than happy to share that. Um, we also do very much expect that in addition to soy and the wheat, the soy and wheat blend continuing uh, to maintain its market leadership in this uh, category, that there'll be in a push to blend additional proteins with soy <clears throat> as soy provides a stability. It's well understood and it's relatively um, cheap compared to a lot of other plant proteins. There are also additional benefits we think can be gained by blending. So we fully expect that that's going to be a, a significant approach over the past, next uh, couple of uh, years and decades as this industry evolves. Um, <clears throat> and finally, I'll just mention that this is a, another uh, slide from our plant protein primer um, resource. And just noting again that soy is the gold standard. It has a lot of the functional properties that the industry is looking for. and. Um, it is the most predictable to work with and, and has a lot of other, of course, benefits that I, I think a lot of you are, are aware of with the only con major concern um, uh, in the category being allergenicity uh, for the percentage of consumers who are allergic to it. It's an issue um, as well as flavor. And I think a lot of that could be um, improved with just the better flavor modulation technology and, and of course, breeding soybeans uh, varieties and, and cultivars that are specifically optimized for um, and use in, in uh, plant-based uh, uh, meat applications. I'll close with just a few uh, final thoughts on where we expect this category to go from here and some ideas for how you all can uh, get involved if you're interested. Uh, the first uh, thing I'll mention is that um, we certainly as an organization are optimistic about the future of this category, uh, but there are other uh, market research firms who are also optimistic about its growth potentially with uh, some fairly large projected market volumes over the next few decades, which is tremendously exciting. Uh, and we think um, at least some of these scenarios, uh, perhaps not the most optimistic ones, but some of these scenarios are certainly plausible. Um, we have endeavored to map out some of the challenges and needed solutions at different stages of the value chain. Uh, and that uh, information is available on our website, but we think these represent the technical uh, and commercial breakthroughs that'll be required to continue the growth of this category over the next few years and decades. Uh, so that's available. 
and then uh, we have a, a quite a few other uh, opportunities. Some of these are commercial, but a lot of these um, boil down to technological challenges that uh, um, we think are um, hopefully relevant to many of the, the folks that you work with and represent sort of the, the white space or frontier of innovation in this category. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, jump to uh, my final slide here just to uh, make sure I end on time. Uh, but please feel free to visit our website at gfi.org for further information. And then if there's any questions that I can't address in the Q&A or we don't have time to, uh, please feel free to email me. Uh, my email's at the bottom of the slide. If there are any questions that I can help with. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Uh, we congratulate our speakers. Uh, pretty timely with time. So thank you very much. So before we move on, on to the Q&A session, I just wanted uh, to welcome our moderator, uh, um, old friend from Music Family, Jose Manuel Rodriguez is associate and founder of the Mexican Association of uh, uh, of food products where he right now is a general manager he has more than 25 years of experience representing the guild in the agro business where he focuses on sustainable strategies implementation of public policies uh, with the different executive um, judicial and, and legal powers so in his trajectory he has always inspired uh, changes in uh, transformational changes in between the different producers of livestock and agricultural products that can affect the productivity and growth of these areas. Uh, he uh, graduated from IPN as uh, uh, international relationships uh, um, professional, and he also studied in a civil engineer in Autonoma Universidad de Mexico now. So Jose Manuel, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning. Good morning to you all for, for the invitation. Now, uh, we are in the Q&A session. A couple of questions that are very interesting, pretty uh, folks on, on, on Vanguard thoughts. Uh, both presentations were great, Oliver and Zach. So we have a series of questions for, for both of you. So for Oliver, uh, Oliver, just as an introduction, what has happened this last year will uh, basically has led us uh, to both types of changes that you were speaking during uh, during your presentation, both ad adaptive as transformational. What could you uh, uh, say we were obliged maybe because of the situation in, in then in a regular or ordinary situation, uh, this has led to lockdowns and obviously uh, made us uh, innovate a bit more and work from home. So how have you seen these changes? Have they been adapt adaptive mainly or how do you see them? Uh, I see the changes in regards to the lockdowns and working remotely. I see that as being um, in a lot of cases more transformational. Now, for, for um, some organizations were already working remotely. They already had a process in place. And in the cases of those associations, it was probably more of an adaptive change. It was just a matter of getting all of their employees online instead of just some. But for uh, any organization that did not have a clear process in place, for example, um, if you didn't have, say, Zoom, or you didn't have certain accounts already set up, imagine if you have 50 or 100 uh, employees and everybody's using like their own platforms, you know, Teams, uh, the, uh, Microsoft Teams, or they're using Zoom, or they're using Slack, and they're using, you know, their own different applications. And now they're not familiar with how to use these other applications. That alone can be very disruptive because now they have to stop what they're doing and learn a new way of doing things. So um, it just depends on how you were, you were already set up, basically. Thank you, Oliver. 
Okay, so we have another couple of questions. Just let me look at this. With which other uh, protein, uh, uh, plant proteins besides soy are the most popular for, yeah, just give me a question, read this question once again. Okay, this is for SAC. With what other uh, plant-based proteins besides soy are the most popular nowadays for a, a dairy companies uh, that, or, or a, egg producing companies or, or plant-based meat? Yeah, the, so good question. So, uh, so uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, Go ahead. he was finishing the question, but yeah, sure, full oh, choice. Okay. Uh, yeah, with what other proteins besides soy cut might be popular in order for dairy companies they can formulate or work with? Let's imagine that's a soy alternative that we're being asked here. Yeah, what other alternatives besides soy can we find for these types of products? Uh, so currently soy is the, the most used ingredient um, and wheat is generally number two and then pea protein is the number three protein um, within the dairy category, uh, uh, plant-based milk, for example. Uh, oat protein is growing quite a bit, almond protein is used quite a bit and uh, things like cashew, um, macadamia nuts uh, are also used frequently as uh, uh, sources of, of protein. Um, it really drops off from, from there. Um, Plant-based egg category is pretty tiny, but it often uses mung bean protein. It's still a very small amount of, of volume globally. I do think that over the next few years, say the, the medium term of uh, between five to 10 years from now, um, the only other proteins that are likely to be used at high levels would be from uh, protein from oil seeds. Uh, so canola, uh, rapeseed protein, or sunflower protein, just given that it's widely grown and consumed and a lot of protein would be available and, and um, processing capacity could be uh, modified to um, allow it to be processed into an intermediary ingredient. Um, beyond 10 years, it's, it's difficult to say um, what proteins will be uh, the most uh, dominant or which uh, other proteins will be competitive with soy. Um, I would say that you know, what, what makes soy the leader currently is the, the cost is low. It's well understood and generally product formulators can get the functionality and sensory attributes that they want from it. And so um, if certain oil seed uh, proteins end up being um, favorable for those, you know, under those similar, for similar reasons of price and sensory quality, uh, they would be competitive. Um, and there's obviously an enormous number of potential plant protein sources that could be competitive, but it's hard to imagine them scaling up significantly enough to uh, to compete with soy on anything other than like a 20 year time frame. Uh, yeah, uh, Jose Manuel, I have a question. Uh, Carlos Salinas is speaking here. Yeah. Questions for SAC. SAC. There's different visions in terms of the relationship of alternative proteins and proteins generated by uh, by livestock, and all the information that I've seen till the moment, what I've found is that both performances are complementary. In other words, we're not necessarily competing one against the other what we're seeing or what i believe that we're seeing is a progression for people that didn't consume uh, the types of protein in the past so we're expanding the, the total amount of protein in the world is this right or wrong and what's your opinion particularly when we speak about an evolution of the next five years uh, we won't have countries as, as India, maybe, that would grow exponentially in these types of, of plant proteins. What is your view in global growth? Are we competing one against the other or are we not? Yeah, well, th there certainly is you know, some competition in the sense that you know, your existing products are competing for share of stomach uh, with today's consumers. But yeah, ultimately, this is a market that's very large. And, and as, as you pointed out, 
is growing, you know, both as the global population expands, but also, of course, as the global population demands additional protein and is looking for uh, different types of protein in its diet. So, uh, yeah, I certainly don't think that plant-based meat is going to represent a significant uh, threat to animal uh, protein um, over the next few years, you know, considering all the growth that is ahead for, for animal protein um, and in consumption growth and in uh, protein demanded growth on a per capita basis. Um, so yeah, so plant-based proteins uh, are, um, can, yeah, can be a feature. Uh, it's something that consumers are integrating into their diets as part of a rotation of different types of protein, but very few consumers, relatively speaking, at least in most countries, are moving fully to plant proteins. And that, that doesn't seem likely to change um, anytime in the, in the uh, short to, to medium term future. So we expect that you know, most consumers are omnivores, they're flexitarian, they're going to probably increase the percentage of protein they're getting from plant sources, uh, but they will also of course be continuing to increase their overall protein consumption. So it still represents growth for both industries. Um, beyond that, I, I think there are some other complementary um, you know, potential benefits here, maybe in, in the way in which we are able, you know, this industry can utilize certain types of cropland or pasture land versus what the um, livestock industry can utilize. Um, there might be opportunities for uh, this industry to utilize side streams, like maybe protein, lower value protein uh, byproducts from so oil processing um, in ways that are helpful um, in the animal agriculture industry and vice versa. Um, so yeah, th there's definitely going to be competition, you know, in some ways in the market, but there's the, the market's big enough for everyone. Um, and there are, um, and certainly at the, like the farm level, this is just a different, you know, this is just a different end use for the same crop. Crystal clear sack. Thank you. Uh, perfect. Carlos, thank you very much. Now let's uh, move on. SAC. Nowadays, during the pandemic, or in times of pandemic, how have you seen uh, the protein market affected? What factors have affected you the most? How, uh, what can you tell us about this? Yeah, so during the pandemic, uh, at least, yeah, in the food system, most of the, the change or the, the challenge that was presented by the shift was um, uh, consumers, you know, shifting a lot of their food uh, consumption from out of home channels like restaurants into in home channels like grocery so that that created a lot of ripple effects you know changing what people would buy to put in their pantry people buying more things to put in their pantry to, to store for food um, you know creating a more in home consumption and preparing of foods which changes how people think about how they cook and what they cook um, that was the biggest shift. So we saw a very large sales growth in our industry, like like almost every other food industry. We saw a lot of sales shift away from food service and um, and restaurant channels to uh, in home cooking and, and more grocery uh, retail channels. Uh, so that was the single biggest shift uh, for the, the category. Um, and overall, it, it seemed to um, that the industry handled the transition fairly well. Um, there were some shortages and interruptions of different you know some plant-based products faced shortages, some animal-based protein products faced shortages, but overall it seemed to um, handle the shift well. Um, investment continued, um, research and development was able to continue for the most part with minimal interruptions. Um, so yeah, so the, the pandemic didn't really um, uh, affect uh, the direct consumer experience of, of getting plant-based products all that much. Um, I think the one thing that did significantly change uh, and hopefully will lead to a, a really big paradigm shift um, on the part of global governments and food industry leaders is that all of a sudden the salience of things like um, zoonotic diseases that jump from animals to humans became uh, much more you know, pressing. And so uh, uh, when we think about food system security and safety and resilience, we do want to, you know, in our opinion, of course, we want to diversify our protein sources to include more plant proteins. Uh, but, you know, it also provides impetus for things like, you know, worker safety and higher animal welfare uh, and sanitary conditions standards um, and, and ways to uh, ensure that we don't, you know, uh, have to close down uh, slaughterhouses last minute like we, we saw early on in the pandemic and we don't have, you know, cold, cold chain uh, shipping challenges. Um, so 
I think uh, the pandemic in many ways will provide um, motivation, hopefully, for governments and policy stakeholders and food industry leaders to, um, yeah, to build, build back in a way that uh, um, is, yeah, is safe, more safe and resilient since we now know what the, the full implications can be of something like this pandemic. During your presentation, if uh, you were speaking about uh, protein alternatives, obviously everything's focused towards self-sufficiency, having uh, uh, the required food supply, as as FAO uh, suggests from from the United Nations. So. What's your opinion uh, on biotechnology? Because uh, you didn't speak about biotechnology. So what's your opinion on biotechnology use, both on, on, on plant and animal-based proteins in order to obtain these objectives of uh, food supply? Well, uh, you know, probably un unsurprisingly, we're, we're certainly supportive of most forms of technology that are used to improve the you know the sustainability the nutritional um, you know attributes of the the foods that we consume uh, and 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 yeah to the extent that that can support um, other other food policy goals as well um, so yeah our our stance is very much technology agnostic so uh, there are certain forms of biotechnology such as uh, cell culturing meat or utilizing recombinant protein production. Um, uh, to produce uh, different ingredients or inputs that go into these products, maybe as flavor or aroma uh, or other types of functional ingredients. And, and in some cases, you know, you know, like using microorganisms as protein sources. So utilizing like mushrooms and fungi or algae as, as protein sources is something that we think is very promising um, ultimately. Um, and, you know, and that technology we think has a lot of potential, but it also has to be uh, wielded carefully uh, not all consumers are interested in in biotechnology uh, products, and of course, uh, you know the the history of of things like uh, uh, GMO uh, technology and genetic engineering technology demonstrates that. So, um, we sort of take an all the above approach, um, and it's not about uh, you know picking one technology right now that's going to be a winner. We think you know, a lot of biotechnology is very promising, um, but it's it's part of a a full toolkit of um, resources we have and technologies we have and it's not the only one that we are staking our hopes on uh, you know trying to create a, um, a healthy and, and sustainable um, and resilient food system thank you sack oliver how have you perceived in this last year, are we facing a technological change revolution in order to adapt ourselves to this new reality? Could we consider this as a revolution? A revolution meaning a corporate revolution because of the adaptation that corporations need to follow in those points that you mentioned, both in technology and the other aspects that you previously mentioned, because I believe that this last year uh, practically was, was was a pretty radical change for corporations and how how everything has uh, revolved. What can you mention? Do you think it's revolution or not? Uh, I think it's revolutionary if if it stays like this. <laughs> Uh, I, I think that we're going to continue to see a number of major changes happen um, in different parts of the world at different times. Um, right now, I'm based in the U.S. and you know, I'm based on the East Coast, and we're going through a you know, you know, possible gas shortage. You know, like a a, a a pipeline got attacked by a cyber attacker. So I think from a revolutionary standpoint, technology even outside of your industry. So I know, you know, I've heard and I've seen a lot of conversation, especially in this association about the, so, you know, obviously about soybeans, but outside of the production and the product side, we also have the te technology side having to deal with 
different disruptions to our supply chains, uh, possible disruptions to our technology. So when we think about change, and of course, in this case, technology, I think we need to have plans in place um, and maybe even alternative plans in case some of our systems or technology goes down or it's, it's uh, inoperable or it's attacked or whatnot. So I think that that's something that we need to keep, keep in mind. But from a revolutionary standpoint, another thing I would say in regards to technology is looking out into the uh, industry in different parts of the world. I know we're talking about the Americas now, um, but outside of the Americas, maybe looking for some innovative technology that's used in, in, in say, um, the uh, Asia region or in the European region and seeing if there are any things we can bring back to our region to help us improve our processes and remain competitive in a, uh, in a world that's, that's always changing. And one other thing I say, um, and I like what Zach said, um, it's also about looking outside of the soy industry and looking at alternative industries, seeing what practices and technologies they're using that may be applicable to the current industry and so that we can uh, be more proactive instead of being reactive. Not saying we're being reactive now necessarily, but being more proactive. Thank you, Oliver. Uh, uh, change and change of management, how much do you think that this will become a, a need in strategic planning? This is the way the question has been phrased. Uh, uh, well, let me repeat this. Uh, change and change management. How much do you think they'll become need in terms of strategic planning? I think change management in regards to a strategy will, I think it's been there. Um, it, it's, we see it less so uh, being necessary, at least traditionally, uh, up until the, the uh, current times. Obviously, all of us are going through a massive amount of change on, on both, both our personal level and on a corporate level. But I see you know, some industries that don't have a lot of changes going on. Say you're in, say for example, if you're in an industry that doesn't have a lot of competition, or if you're in an industry where things have always been done the same way and there's no need to make, make any changes. Say, say for example, you know, um, regulations limit the number of, of companies providing a certain um, product. In that case, from a product standpoint, you probably won't see a lot of changes. But even if you don't see a lot of changes on the production side, you could potentially see changes, like I said, having to deal with threats, both economically, both uh, from a government standpoint. So just because your, your association or your industry isn't being impacted by the product side, say by um, soy, uh, other aspects or things of which folks might use as alternatives to soy, you still have to keep in mind the changes that you may have to make in regards to um, economic changes, government changes, cyber attacks, and, and a number of other things, which could potentially impact things such as your uh, supply chains, such as your employees. So if your employees are working remotely and there's a power outage, there's storms, there's hurricanes, there's riots, there's a number of other things, I think that those are the changes that le leadership are going to have to think about and have, again, have uh, backup plans in place in case, for, for example, my uh, Mexican office goes down for, for whatever reason, can I stand up or, or, or can I send that traffic automatically to, say, my Colombian office? These are things I think that, that we'll have to deal with for the foreseeable future. And, and, and I think a backup plan um, at a minimum needs to be um, at least thought about and instituted in advance of these things happening. Mm -hmm. 
thank you, Oliver. The last question that we have, and due to time, this is a question for SAC. Are there, or what specific regulations do you consider uh, that are the most important that companies should know? Uh, speaking about the companies that are represented here, companies uh, that are mainly for, for human consumption and animal consumption, for being uh, uh, animal protein or, 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 or human consumption products. Zach, in your opinion, what specific regulations you believe are the most important that companies should know or be aware of speaking about the companies that we have here? Uh, I'm, I'm not a regulatory expert, but it, um, for <clears throat> cases of um, creating new products, generally this isn't a novel food. Um, when you're creating a plant-based meat, egg or dairy product, you're using very well-known ingredients uh, such as soy, uh, it's well understood. So um, generally speaking, the, the most important things have to do with, you know, uh, import export requirements um, and the uh, uh, food safety laws and uh, regimes that are in place to ensure that the, the quality is there. Um, beyond that, uh, uh, the, the other area of regulatory um, actions that uh, can affect uh, at least plant-based in the egg and dairy products is labeling. Uh, restrictions. So restricting the use of, say, the term uh, milk. So you can't maybe call it soy milk. You have to call it uh, soy beverage uh, or soy drink or something like that. Um, uh, or, you know, being prohibited from using meat-like terms such as uh, uh, burger uh, on, on the packaging. Um, so those laws vary depending on the jurisdiction, uh, depending on the country, depending on, in, in some cases, like in the United States, uh, different states have different requirements and restrictions on those terms. Uh, different, uh, you know, the European Union has considered similar bans on different terms. So that's probably the most important thing to consider if you're going to be importing or, or selling products um, into this category. It's it's relying on very well-known ingredients that are widely uh, used today and and shouldn't represent any regulatory challenges for the most part. But the the marketing and packaging and branding occasionally does have restrictions that are in place based on uh, the regulatory system. Uh, thank you. If there are any other uh, questions, uh, uh, we'll be sending you out uh, both Oliver's and Sachs uh, keynotes where they have their emails and they can you can contact them uh, further on. So I believe that the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Zach. Thank you, Oliver. Well, thank you, Jose Manuel. Lots of questions still pending to be answered, but uh, we don't have enough time. Uh, this is the last part of our agenda, of today's agenda. We will have the participation of Dr. Maria Mayorga. Uh, she's a technical expert for um, poultry culture uh, in the Americas. Uh, she has a master's degree in say, of animal sciences from University of Columbia, PhD of animal production from Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul from Brazil, and she also uh, has an academic visitor position uh, for Arkansas University for poultry science. Uh, she has been involved in different researches about um, poultry uh, nutrition. This is a summary of her uh, uh, curriculum. So now she uh, will be with us speaking about animal protein Maria, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Belinda. The screen is all right. You guys see me okay? Okay, perfect. So thank you all for your participation today and for uh, staying connected and participating actively in, in this uh, session. I'll be speaking a little bit about of the reason why it's important for us to have animal-based protein and why it's key for you being associations of bass feed or, or swine and poultry production play a key role in global um, food security. So as you all might know, the importance of proteins as a fundamental component of a healthy consumption pattern, uh, we, uh, here we have different proteins. We have uh, make uh, milk 
egg and meat, uh, they offer necessary elements for a, for a healthy development in different stages of human life that at the end become the final consumers of proteins that you and us produce. It's also very important then to recognize that uh, the growth, uh, not just in consumption, has been uh, widely affected constantly in the last years. You could see this graph as a projection. So this forecast is a measurement of a protein consumption. Uh, you could see uh, blue and red. These are um, a sheep protein and livestock protein. And you could see the growth is not as aggressive as a meat coming from monogastric species, species specifically swine, and also chicken meat or poultry uh, industry that's versatile, it's still economic, and doesn't have no cultural, no religious uh, constraints. So this consumption, we have as a reaction, an increase in the production of the species, as we might see here, mainly swines, uh, that in the last uh, three decades, have increased uh, uh, not just because of the growth of population but also because of the increase uh, in buying powers a uh, larger variety in diets um, improving economic uh, revenues in countries and obviously uh, factors associated directly uh, with production So we are more efficient in producing protein in a short cycle of time with the help of animals that have been selected uh, genetically and with the use of ingredients or highly digestible ingredients. So we've seen that the importance or that boom of alternative proteins, alternative proteins have made it into the market and have grown considerably, but let's see which are the implications of these types of alternative proteins. And as it was mentioned before, in previous presentations, this will have as an objective to supply the demand of very specific types of groups, such as patientarians that definitely don't want to remove animal proteins from their menu, but do want to reduce them. As you might see here in this study in, in 2019, uh, what was the intention of uh, incorporating traditional uh, proteins? Less people want to eat beef, pork, poultry, uh, but fish is the one that has grown the most. Poultry and fish have grown the most because this have been associated to much healthier habits. This is key also to bear in mind. We also see that proteins, vegetable proteins uh, or, or plant proteins or different types of alternatives as it was mentioned in the presentation. First, it would be vegetal or, or, or plant uh, uh, meat. There's studies, even though they're few, wouldn't be as different from the conventional uh, meat, such as uh, poultry, swine, uh, or livestock. But uh, so sodium uh, is higher, protein is less. Protein coming from insects, we, we all of us know, or all of us, we have an idea of the high protein content of this raw material, but nevertheless, People don't fully understand what are the implications, this uh, the implications of processing these insects if we don't have the, uh, uh, the enough care. If we, we need to remember that these variations in protein might be depending on the type of insect that we are uh, that's being used. But this is a good quality protein, is high in fibers and minerals, but nevertheless studies are limited in terms of the effect there is of replacing total uh, total replacement of 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 uh, animal protein for insect protein we need to understand further what would be the impact that this alternative proteins might have in the health of humans if algaes uh, these are not uh, unknown uh, for animal production, and we do know about studies and antioxidant uh, traits have been uh, recognized and there's in vitro studies too, but human studies have not been done yet 
they're very limited or many of these are based on empiric evaluations and finally we have a meats cultivated in laboratories this is a bit more complex due to the perception that the consumption in general has we don't have much information about the effect it has on long-term diets now let's see which would be these effects or what are the motivations that consumer might have in order to consume the types of protein first of all people want to see the nutritional quality in general red meats are associated to higher risk of cardiovascular diseases or processed meats are also associated to carcinogenic effects but we need to bear in mind that we require much more studies for us to be really sure of what's the real effect of replacing the animal proteins for other types of alternative proteins in a complete diet and in a longer period of time in terms of nutrient densities nutrient density is something that's very complex it's much easier uh, when we're working with these types of uh, products uh, but uh, we should uh, carry out studies evaluating both uh, according to the typical methods and seeing what's the real magnitude that these effects might have. In terms of price, um, there's a, uh, there must be a certain a sensorial attractiveness and alternative uh, proteins have this novelty and this might be a short-term driver for these types of proteins but we need to think on price uh, we are feeding a growing population and produce proteins must be economically accessible for all the population without distinguishing uh, the socioeconomic uh, strategies so we could see for example um, meal coming from um, f from insect protein might be up to 41 dollars uh, laboratory protein might be up to 300 dollars and for, ex for example beyond sausages could be 70 percent more expensive than a conventional swine sausage so we need to be aware of these factors that are directly related with these types of products. Another a motivation that the consumer have in order to consume this uh, alternative, um, alternative proteins is um, animal welfare and environment uh, and, and the environment. So we need to bear in mind that those beverages uh, done from almond might use larger amounts of water than what you use to produce a liter of milk. Or if we're speaking about meats and um, cultivated in laboratories, the usage of reactive acids and everything that you need in energy and water consumption is a very large input and very expensive input for the amount of protein that we're producing right now in laboratory. So as you might see, we have many opportunities to improve and we also have challenges if we're speaking about alternative a protein then to improve in terms of appearance in terms of the sense sensory attributes of the product a flavor and taste in order to come closer to what a conventional meat looks like obviously we need more studies and more longitudinal evidence that allow me to see the complete uh, processing time and the complete replacement in this uh, in a period of time and us as animal protein producers or, or balanced feed for the species that generates proteins we also have lots of opportunities first compared with the vegetal proteins we promote and we if we speak about humans we promote a higher muscle synthesis and this is mainly given because of the amino acid profile that meats have in relation to alternative proteins our amino acid profile is much more complete less amino acids will be uh, released into uh, blood paths so the less urea will be produced and less uh, amino acids would be destined to perforate tissues so uh, the uh, so maintaining the muscles in, in kids and adults so as you see it's a very important mission that we all have 
in order to promote consumption of a healthy diet. And as it was mentioned in today's session, the space for all of us, we are not com directly competing, but we have lots of factors that make food production a very strong industry that needs to be more transparent, obviously in order for the consumer to know how meat is produced. And obviously we have the advantage of thinking on sustainability since we think on the ingredients, such as the case of United States. So, so I just wanted to leave you with this reflection. I want to thank you all for your participation and Belinda, floor is yours. Well, thank you, Maria. Well, I'm, I'm still conventional with my days, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave that future animal protein to feed from vegetable protein. So this is last a part of our session. We want to thank you all. I want to thank you all our speakers, uh, excellent speakers, Oliver, Zach, Maria, and our moderator, Jose Manuel. Thank you for your participation. And uh, I have no more to say than invite you to a tomorrow's session. We'll be looking at the future of protein consumption. So we'll see you tomorrow at the same hour in the same channel. So thank you all and see you tomorrow. Mm -hmm.